Hello. How are you? Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. Nice to see you. How's it going? Are you guys back in clinic? We just opened clinic today. Oh, did it go well? Uh, yeah, reduced capacity, obviously 30%. So um, patients are coming back. So it's going to be a while. We focused with the postdoctoral programs first. But yeah, we're, we're back. But today was the first day since mid-March, you know. How about your, your schools? How's Columbia? We opened today for pre-clinic. And then hopefully beginning of August, we'll start again with patients. So it's good to go back in there, you know, after a few months off and see what's happened to the, the hand skills. <laughs> so. Hi, Jacob. How are you? Hi, you good yourself? Good, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, at Buffalo, students are starting back to clinic now. And then, like, for third year students, we're starting back in the pre clinic tomorrow for some lab courses. So it'll be nice to get back to Are it. these ones that should have been finished in the springtime or that would be? Um, this one was intended for a summer course. So, and then we're moving some courses that are um, didactically based to just like remote learning now to save more time for clinic in the fall. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah, no, it's uh, overused, but it's a strange time. Very challenging times, yeah. Definitely true. <laughs> ah, Dr. Raghunathan, how are you? I think he's muted. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me now? Oh, yeah. yeah we can hear you. Okay, good, good. <laughs> nice to see you all with a smiley face. You too. <laughs> You know, it was kind of cool for us when um, we had that webinar a while back. I think Michelle, you had chatted in, you know, in the chat room, how you know Dr. Robinson was your, you know, dentist years ago, and uh, I think that was kind of cool. You know. It was great too because I was trying to get back in touch with him, and I had asked my dad. I said, "Do you have his email address?" My dad was saying, "I only have his address that we send Christmas cards to." So I'm in the middle of like writing him a snail mail, <laughs> and then this happened. It was just very yeah. serendipitous, everything. Yeah. But he was he was thrilled. He was actually <laughs> thrilled. So it was good. So Michelle, you're from Florida. Yes, yes, I am. Of course, Jacob. Where are you from? From Buffalo, New York. Oh, from Buffalo. Okay. Yep. That's where I, first I arrived in U.S. Oh, yeah? Awesome. Yes. My uncle lived in Buffalo, so. Very cool. Yeah, that's a good place. A little cold, but. It's a little colder in the winters, but the summers are very nice, so. Yeah. <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> good. Right now, I'm in Ohio. Of course, Leonie might have told you. Nice. Yeah. Where in Ohio? Canton, Ohio. Football yeah. Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Big Ohio State fan, or yeah, <laughs> that's Very, good. Now, are you a Browns fan or a Bills fan? Well, Browns. Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> I so. kind of moved on from Bills. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. But thanks for asking me. Also, you know, actually, Dr. Robinson and Dr. Leone want to do this, and then uh, Dr. Robinson couldn't do it, so I get to get a chance to see you guys all. So thanks again. It's a quite an honor. Well, thank yep. you for joining. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Someone just said, go Jets. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can they hear us? <laughs> uh -oh. usually, Brown, sorry. usually when it's in the, um, the webinar mode, you have to broadcast it. So maybe we're broadcasting already. Yeah. Browns used to be good, you know. When I was in dental school in 80s, mm -hmm. uh, Bernie Cosa, you guys probably wasn't even born then. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could relate to my son and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it. 1997, so a little bit after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My oldest son was born in 1990. He's a pediatrician now in Pittsburgh. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah Dr. Leone got trained. Awesome. Very nice. Let me just see if I can share the screen. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, like it's disabled for me. Um, okay. Let's see. So I'll stop my share. Then. Okay. You should be able to share. 
It says host disabled. Let's see. Can you try again? I just enabled it. Okay. How does that look okay? Looks good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'll go out of it now because you're gonna you have you're gonna show that before. Okay. Yep. So let me stop the share and give it back to you then. As I said, I don't mind if we go past eight o'clock if the Q and A is going on. I'm okay with that. Do you, Do you know if there's if you want to be strict with the timeline or, or what? Um, I would say we should end pretty close to eight. Um, but yeah, there's still some more lingering questions. Um, up to you guys if you want to stick around or not. But I feel like probably around an hour would be optimal. Okay, understood. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we want to respect y'all's time too. So we really appreciate you spending your time here with us. That's yeah, definitely. Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> now the district two, uh, exactly which part of the US? Uh, I assume East Coast, am New I correct? Jersey. Yes. Yeah. How many states are there on district two? So it's New York and New Jersey. So there's six schools. So it's Buffalo, Columbia, NYU, Rutgers, Stony Brook, and Toro. I see, okay. That's good. How big's the class size in Toro? Oh, I can tell you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, somebody might have just responded. 115. Okay, great. I assume you guys are juniors. Yes. <laughs> yeah, enter junior year. All right. <laughs> Bit nervous, but you know, we're going to get there. Yeah. This exam is a piece of cake. After Dr. Leone's presentation, you guys will know it's not going to be hard. Awesome. Well, glad to hear that. Don't <laughs> <laughs> yes. promise beforehand. <laughs> 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 well, I think I think Jake is actually going to have to take it. He wasn't able to yep. take part one with oh. the COVID changes, so I know I see. people are in that boat. No, I was going to take the integrated and then decided with COVID to try to take part one, part two, to take advantage of the time. But then as a result, like the test center closures got canceled a couple of times, so I figured just, I don't know, enjoy this summer and then... I'll study up and take integrated boards next summer with a lot of the rest of my classmates. So this will be great tonight to learn a little bit more. I've heard it's a great exam. I'm kind of jealous I don't get to take it. <laughs> you don't have the choice. You're doing, you have to do the part Yeah, we get to take um, part one in January. But I've heard great things so far, so I'm really excited to learn more. Yeah, I have a, a slide that has some of the testimonials from students, if you will. And, Pretty good feedback, all in all. So that's great. Well, right now it's seven o'clock, so we can get started with a little introduction here and then let you guys take over. So thank you everybody who's joined so far. Uh, this is a presentation entitled All About the INBDE, the Integrated National Board Dental Examination. This is being presented by AS the District Two's Advocacy and Organized Dentistry Committee. So, so here's our as a district two cabinet. So uh, Michelle can talk a little about as a district two and what we represent. Yeah. So basically, as is the American Student Dental Association, um, it is broken up through all of the United States dental schools. So as the district two represents the six schools in New York and New Jersey. Um, we have members that are both dental students and pre-dental students and nationwide, roughly 24,000 members. Um, it's a great way to get involved in organized dentistry, meet dentists, have networking connections, also meet students across the country, which is always really great. They always have something like very similar going on with you. Um, so just very briefly, as does governing structures trifold. So you have the local level, which is your school. 
you have the district level, which is what we are putting on today, which is the conglomeration of, in our instance, six schools. And then you have the national level, which advocates for the rights and welfare of dental students across the country. For example, one of the most recent efforts was the licensure reform. Um, so basically just to stay updated with your school's ASDA efforts, um, definitely be in contact with your ASDA president. And if you would like to stay in touch with ASDA District 2 and attend more events like this, feel free to follow us on social media. Awesome, thank you. And here's the rest of our District 2 cabinet. And we all work with Michelle to try to produce some programming for students of our member schools and then anybody around the country that's interested can join in. So to give you guys a little bit of a background about the pathway of dental licensure, so we had a webinar a couple weeks ago where we focused a lot about the clinical examination. So um, licensure varies from state to state in the United States, but pretty much it's always threefold. So you need an uh, education component, so that's going to be graduating from a coded accredited dental school. There's the written examination, which has been for the past the um, NBDE parts one and two, and then now moving forward, it's going to be the Integrated National Board Dental Examination. And then thirdly, you need a clinical examination component. And these requirements vary from state to state. Some states, like California, have a portfolio examination. New York State requires at least a one-year residency program to practice. Um, different states have either a clinical licensure exam, and some are moving toward mannequin-based uh, non-patient exams, such as the ADEX confidant exam, which we learned a lot about a couple weeks ago. So today we're gonna to focus on the written examination component and particularly the, the INBDE. So we're gonna introduce our distinguished guest speakers from the Joint Commission of National Dental Examinations. So if you wanna go ahead, Michelle. I will start off. Dr. Leone is the current chair of Joint Commission on National Dental Examinations and is a professor of periodontology and the associate dean for academic affairs at Boston University Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. He also maintains a hospital appointment at Boston Medical Center. Dr. Leone was awarded a DMD from the University of Pittsburgh in 1983 and holds a certificate in periodontology and a Doctor of Medical Sciences and Oral Biology degree from Harvard University. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Leone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And we welcome Dr. Kanthasami Ragu, Ragunathan. Uh, Dr. Ragu is the current vice chair and the chair elect of the JCNDE. Uh, he's the president and owner of Canton Family Dentistry in Canton, Ohio, and has been in private practice for more than 25 years. In addition to practicing general dentistry, Dr. Ragu has several years of teaching experience at dental programs in the Akron area. He is a member of the American Dental Association and the Ohio Dental Association and a past president of the Stark County Dental Association. Dr. Ragu is a graduate of the University of Paradinia in Sri Lanka and Case Western Reserve University School of Dentistry. And again, please join us in welcoming Dr. Ragu. Thank you. Welcome. It's great. And so there, I'll stop sharing my screen, and Dr. Leone, you can toss up your presentation. Great. Well, thank you, and thanks to, to Jacob and to Michelle for organizing these series uh, and for inviting us here this evening. Um, as you know, this presentation originally uh, was scheduled to be a discussion of the DL OSCE, the new licensing exam from the Joint Commission. That will be rescheduled to some future date when Dr. William Robinson can join us. Dr. Robinson is the immediate past chair of the Joint Commission, and he has a lot of experience with clinical licensing exams and boards, uh, having been uh, on the board in Florida for many years as well. So uh, that'll be coming in the future. And with that, having, having um, asked, or we can ask, what's the difference between the DL OSCE and the INDDE? That question seems to be coming up a lot because these are both computer-based exams. And this next graphic, I think, will, will help illustrate that. Um, if you consider all of that a dentist needs to know, and we frame that as a domain of dentistry, that is what the INBDE is examining you on. A slice of that is more practically focused. It's content that's more directly applicable to licensure. 
And there's a, a, a deeper dive, if you will, in that. And from that component is where the dl Oski questions are, are derived from. More specifically, both exams assess clinical competence. And we use the term skills in a more general sense. So diagnosis, treatment, planning, oral health management, et cetera. The IMBD uh, requires you to put together and remember the biomedical behavioral uh, underpinnings uh, of the clinical decisions that you make, uh, the mechanistic reasons or the why things are happening and not happening, and also importantly, ethics, practice, practice management, professionalism considerations. Whereas the dl Oski is focused exclusively on clinical tests. These are the, the understanding of, of things that you need to do day to day in, in your uh, practice with patients. And so it's a narrower focus. And the term that really applies to the dl Oski is micro-judgment. So you're, you're being asked to, to make these micro-judgments day in and day out. We recognize that patients don't walk in having read the textbook or the PowerPoint slides. And so this is what you're, you're doing uh, in your practice. And I would add that for individual dentists who get in trouble with state boards, it's not so much uh, or typically uh, a technical issue of, of, of sort of the hand skills, it's really coming down to judgment issues or, or lack thereof with a particular patient or set of patients. By way of example, then on the national board, the integrated exam, um, if you're asked to remember all of pharmacology, on the dl Oski, uh, more practically, you'd be asked to write an appropriate prescription based on the findings that are presented in a particular case. Similarly, on the integrated exam, if you have to remember your neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, on the dl Oski, you're going to be charged with uh, understanding where the correct placement of the needle is, given that you have the underlying underpinnings of that. Clearly in dentistry, biomaterials is a big part of what we do and what we deal with. Uh, so on the dl Oski, you will be asked perhaps to, to identify why a particular restoration is okay or not okay. In the same vein, in biomaterials, you know, you learn about, you know, hue value chroma, perhaps on the dl Oski, you may have to come up with a proper shade selection. I'm just make, making that up, but I can imagine how that might come uh, in terms of a, a really more performance-based based, uh, example. As you can imagine, however, the dl Oski does not contain content or questions related to research, or statistics, epidemiology, just like the other kinds of clinical licensing exams do, do not have that. So to the INVDE exactly, uh, directly why, what, and how, let's just understand what the purpose of the boards are. All of these boards, be they part one or part two, and now the integrated exam, are designed to help licensing boards determine who has a minimal competency to practice in their state. That, that is the purpose of the exams, and really the only purpose uh, of, these, of these exams, the minimum level of, of knowledge, skills, attributes to practice safely. One may ask then, well, why change from the part one, part two format to something different? Sort of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the counter argument would be, is, is stagnation or staying in place appropriate as well? We recognize the revolving trends in the scope of practice of dentistry. You're seeing new kinds of information being taught to you in your various schools. We recognize also that there are newer approaches in, in testing, the so-called psychometrics, where questions are refined, uh, uh, improved uh, ways of getting at your knowledge. Uh, we did want to have a, a more concerted effort towards direct relevance to the practice of dentistry. And also important, we recognize these are high stakes exams, and so we wanted to help improve the, the experience of candidates who are taking these exams and in the same vein, have more accurate assessment of competency for the various regulatory agencies and licensing boards. Last bullet here talks about how the exam, the new exam is hoping to be more aligned with the kinds of things you're being taught in your schools currently, some of that new material that, that's in your curriculum, and also to indirectly address the need or desire of schools to change their curricula. 
Now, what do I mean by that, that last bit? Well, I think all of you can recognize that for most schools, uh, this, is, this graphic shows the typical uh, way the four years would run. You know, heavily biomedical sciences in year one, to some extent year two. The preclinical techniques courses are a big part usually of year two. And then third and fourth year are the clinical sciences and direct patient care. So for many years, the dental schools, including my own, complained to the boards that, well, we can't change our curriculum because there exists a part one and part two. Well, now that that's gone away, then the schools are free to, to change their curriculum in any way that may suit their particular purpose, given where we are in this day and age with the scope of the, of the dental practice. Maybe something uh, as shown in this schematic or something even different, you know, however creative the schools want to be, they, they can be now that the uh, part one, part two format is no longer in existence. In terms of the framework of how this all came about, uh, came to be, uh, I would say that developing this exam was a, a labor of love uh, for well over a decade. The Joint Commission back in 2009 charged a committee, an ad hoc committee called the Committee for an Integrated Exam, CIE, essentially to develop, come up with this exam. The purpose would stay the same, again, so that state boards of dentistry can, can ascertain that an individual seeking licensure is qualified to practice in that state. The focus would be more on clinical relevance. And the term integration, you know, the I of INDDE is, is in the title, um, but integration is the tool. It's the mechanism of how the clinical relevance is, is achieved for the purpose of uh, this particular exam. And when we talk about a content domain, the content domain is the set of behaviors, knowledge, skills, and abilities that a test measures. The content domain of the integrated exams does reflect that integration between the foundational knowledge, that underlying knowledge that you need to have in order to adequately perform your clinical uh, areas uh, as a successful practitioner. And how is this done? This is done by what's called a practice analysis. Essentially, uh, surveys are sent out to very many dentists. These are mostly, in essence, all general dentists. And they're asked the question of all of the kinds of content clinical areas uh, that are being presented. How often do you see these in practice? And how important or critical are they to your patient care? Then all that data has been compiled and uh, put together for the content, the questions for the integrated exam. And so the integrated exam content domain is the domain of dentistry that I alluded to in that first schematic at the beginning of the presentation. So 56 content areas have been identified. These represent the tasks that an entry level general, general dentist must perform uh, safely, adequately uh, in practice. There's a history of how these came about and how many there were initially and why 56 and ended up to be that number. Uh, not relevant for this evening, other than to know that each of those is classified into one of three areas, diagnosis and treatment planning, oral health management, and practice and profession. And with these are 10 so-called foundation knowledge areas, FK areas, that again represent the underlying knowledge that one needs to have to uh, apply correctly those, those clinical tasks. And this uh, shows the relative distribution of those three component sections. Diagnosis and treatment planning is a little bit more than a third. Not surprisingly, oral health management is the biggest slice of this pie. Uh, these are the areas that deal with the, the, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of dental practice, you know, the real technical aspects. But also important, and, and an important amount of the exam are the practice and profession pieces. I won't read all of these, uh, it may be hard for you to see them anyways, but under the diagnosis and treatment planning area, the 15 uh, content areas, you're not surprised to see that you have to interpret uh, data of the patient, medical history, dental history, and all of that, identify and understand the chief complaint, perform a head and neck evaluation, et cetera, all the way down. Uh, typically what you, you, you see in your, in your practices in school uh, in terms of diagnosis and treatment planning. 
Uh, the majority of the content areas are in this oral health management. Uh, again, I'm not going to read each one, but you shouldn't be surprised that you have to prevent, recognize, manage medical emergencies, do the same thing for dental emergencies, recognize and manage pain, bleeding, trauma, infection, etc. This is the area that, that questions you on uh, karyology, restorative, fixed prosthodontics, removable prosthodontics, implantology, endodontics, periodontology, oral surgery, uh, et cetera. This is, this is the, basically the bulk of, I think, how many students view what they're learning and, and what they're trying to learn well in their, in their schools. And then equally important in practice and profession, things like understanding emergent trends in healthcare. We've seen in the last few months that we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, we were subject very significantly to public health issues that caused us to curtail our educational and practice uh, performances. Uh, social determinants of health, we're recognizing that these are important in dentistry as well as in medicine and public health. Uh, those of you know about early childhood caries seemingly affects disproportionately certain cohorts of individuals. Evaluating scientific literature, things that maybe uh, are not as exciting for, for some students, but you begin to see why schools are making an effort to teach these uh, because these are viewed as important for modern day practice. And halfway down, you see OSHA and HIPAA, and again, the same kinds of things that you would expect in this particular uh, area. When you look at the foundation areas, these mostly would be what you would expect from the part one national board. Uh, the biochemistry, cell biology, immunology, et cetera. Uh, FK3, I will point out, does not exist in, in medicine. This is because dentists are heavily involved in biomaterials. We are applied biomaterials experts, if you will, you know, polymer chemists, uh, the materials that we, we use in restorations, the various materials we use as cements and booting agents, et cetera. Uh, FK9, behavioral sciences, ethics, jurisprudence, uh, equally important, as is FK10, research met methodology, bioinformatics analysis, the kinds of things that are involved in modern day practice of dentistry. I don't necessarily need to have you remember these, these numbers, but just to complete the, the story here, the distribution across the, five, the 10 FK areas, how they relate to the three clinical component sections uh, and the distribution um, that you see here. And, and this information is all provided on the, on the website uh, if you want to review. And this, this recording uh, will be available to you all uh, after, after the session. One of the original members of that committee I mentioned, the Committee for an Integrative Exam, is Dr. Andrew Spielman. I think a number of you this evening know, know Dr. Spielman. He and others were looking to compare how the part one, part two format and the INVD format were comparing and uh, comparable in terms of the content and questions on the exams. So just a few examples, I won't go through all of them, but here, this FK5 is the immunology, innate immunity, inflammation uh, component. And you see by the color coding, this is, would be all that you would see in, in part one. Now, at this point, I imagine that maybe some individuals are feeling a little bit of anxiety. Uh, for example, how do I remember what I had in the first year when I'm taking the integrated exam, maybe in fourth year or something like that? Um, and the point being is that this graphic, the, the circles don't represent the, the amount, the quantity. These are just qualitative uh, graphic representations. So looking at the end on the right, parasitology clearly is not that huge in dentistry. However, if you're going to practice tropical medicine in tropical areas uh, or have patients from the tropics, uh, you may have to know about the parasite that causes elephantiasis. So maybe you might see one exam, uh, uh, one question on the exam related to that. Mycology, perhaps a few more. We're aware of candidiasis. But not only that, we know that you see commercials about don't take this drug or that drug if you live in an area where fungal infections are endemic. Well, Southwest part of the United States, Central Valley of California has, has you know, fungal infections as being endemic. So you might get some questions related to that. Virology, of course, uh, you know, um, hepatitis, uh, Epstein-Barr, Coxsackie virus, and of course, now, you know, 
SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so you can imagine questions on that. And as I hope you'll see in some of the practice questions I'm gonna show you, that the kinds of things the integrated exam is asking about foundational knowledge is not going to be a lot of minutia. Uh, and, and, and we hope that you'll see that that's true as you go through that exam. Pharmacology here in the yellow, classic part two questions. But you see here under the new part, uh, EBD, biomedical research, public health policy, and what would be the public health policy? Well, you can imagine the, the opioid use and overuse would come into play as you're being asked about pharmacology. And lastly here, uh, behavioral science, ethics, jurisprudence. Uh, in the yellow, the things that you are seeing or would see on part two, but here in the, in the orange circles, uh, geriatric medicine, uh, child psychology, sociology, ergonomics, certainly very important for a long, long uh, life as a practitioner, uh, and dental and medical informatics. So these are the things that you're seeing again in schools being taught because these are viewed as important components in modern day dental practice. Okay, uh, actually coming up with the questions, how does that occur? I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's important to, to go over a couple of things. Please keep in mind that all of these exams, whether it's the integrated exam, my, uh, my timer just went off. Okay, the integrated exam uh, and the part one, part two is, is really, it's a pass fail exam. It's looking to distinguish what's called the just qualified candidate. The just qualified candidate is an individual who has the minimum knowledge, skills, and abilities to pass the exam and to be licensed to practice safely and adequately, as I've said several times now. So that's, that's how these exams are designed. They're not designed to, to rank individuals. And that's why that, that cut score of a 75 is confusing because that's not a percentile. It, these are called standard scores. And if you look at, at the scale, it doesn't go down, it's not zero to 99. Uh, that cut score, the reason that that 75 exists is to allow normalization over different versions of an exam. As you know, if you take an exam on a Tuesday, you're probably not gonna have the same exact questions if you took the exam on a Friday. So that, that, that approach is the psychometric approach to normalize this pass-fail exam across the different days, the different questions that are given on any different, different exam format, as the, the, ver the version is referred to as a format. Um, and so that's why when I have an occasional student tell me, gee, Dr. Leone, I got a 74 in part one, I missed it by a point. Not really, unfortunately. You probably got a dozen questions wrong that if you'd gotten right, or right you would have you um, maybe passed. So that, that cut score is really designed to, to identify where the not just qualified person is and the just qualified person is. If you're looking for a test that does give you uh, an ability to rank your knowledge and, and discriminate top students from not so top students, the ADAT is the exam, the advanced DAT. Uh, a number of postdoctoral programs are requiring it, not all at this point in time. And that's actually scored like uh, the SAT, it goes from 200 to 800. And if you got a 600, you did better than someone that gets a 400 on the ADAT. But that's not the case for the integrated or part one, part two exams. They're really pass fail exams. Last two bullets, the exams are written, the questions are written so we don't cover esoteric knowledge or trivia. You probably have all had questions on exams where you, you're given a lot of information. All you have to do is find the one thing that you really need and you answer the question. These are, questions are not designed to test you how well you read the English language or can decipher extraneous from non-extraneous information. They're really designed to give you the information to test what's really being tested, your knowledge of clinical dentistry. And then lastly, once again, making all this perhaps more relevant to the clinical situation. So who makes up these questions? These are very dedicated individuals that come together, about half a dozen or so individuals in a test construction team, and there are very many test construction teams. They meet for an intensive half week, three days or more, at least once a year, and sometimes more than once a year, where they basically get together, 
they hash out the questions, submit them, and then those questions are, period are reviewed as each exam is administered to make sure that they stay relevant and, and are answering or uh, getting at what is desired to be got at. And importantly here in the bold, the last bullet, is that these are general dentists by and large. So that again, this integrated exam should not have much in the way of uh, very spoke focused minutia, let's say in biochemistry. And I say biochemistry because I trained in biochemistry. Uh, that's really not what this exam and the questions are designed to, to get at. So the patient box uh, is considered new. How new is new? I don't know. You may have seen something similar to this in other exams and, and all of that. But the idea is the information for a case is presented, you know, the patient, the chief complaint, the background, and the current findings. And here, um, going quickly through these patient, uh, you get the demographics uh, of the individual. And I use this uh, slide to make just one quick point. Currently, gender is still given as a binary code, if you will, male, female. But there's a, certainly a recognition that that may change, may need to change. And the point I want to make here is that these exam questions are never cast in stone. As we evolve, as knowledge evolves, uh, these exams questions are looked at for continuing relevancy and are either tweaked or discarded as the case may be. On down, chief complaint, self-evident, background self-evident. And just to emphasize here on current findings, here this particular example says maximum opening of 10 millimeters, but you could have anything in there. Edema, lymphadenopathy, you know, blood glucose, uh, temperature, blood pressure, what have you. I did say that you're not gonna have a lot of extraneous information in these questions. However, understand that the same case could be used on different versions of the exam by asking slightly different questions. So that means you might see under the current findings category, some information that you may deem not so relevant for the particular question you're being asked, but it may be relevant for a question being asked on a different version of the exam on some other day. Here I have three examples. This is a biochemistry example, uh, and, and hopefully an example of when I said, don't have too much anxiety about remembering all the biomedical sciences. This is asking simply how this plaque pH change after having uh, sugar intake, in this case, a, a sugary drink. Uh, and for those of you that may remember, these curves are called the Stefan curve. And uh, it's asking you to know what, which, which one it is, and here, answer A. Um, you may further know and may be asked to know that, that individuals who have high, moderate, or low caries risk will have different resting pH and will have a different slope of the rebound of this Stefan curve, uh, depending on you know, what category they're in. You're not going to likely be asked the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. No one's going to ask you to calculate pKa's of, of amino acid side chains and, and all of that. So again, this is what is intended by the biomedical sciences example being more clinically relevant that a, a clinician, a general dentist, would probably need to recall given a patient. Another example here, not surprisingly, uh, this question is, is basically asking you to remember uh, what innervates the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Um, fair game, uh, obviously. And the last one here has to do with uh, the appropriate uh, antibiotic if someone is allergic to penicillin. I will point out that these test construction teams develop these questions by consensus. We are finding occasionally that a faculty member in some school will disagree with the consensus of that test construction team. And that's okay, that's okay. Uh, again, these questions are always being analyzed and if there are problems with them, they're either rewritten or sent back to the construction teams the following cycle or they're discarded in favor of a, of a, of a better question. You may know and some of you may have taken the field test. This was the pilot uh, exams to get data on the exam, the integrated exam before it was officially launched. Uh, three different field tests were conducted. 
uh, with increasing numbers of individuals. So the way this happened was once you registered for part two, you were invited to also take this particular exam, either before or after the part two that you, that you had registered for. Uh, the, 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 the hook we had was cash. Uh, individuals were paid to do this, but it was prorated. We wanted to make sure individuals didn't just take it as a lark. We wanted individuals to do the best they could so we could get the best data we, we could. I think the numbers range from uh, $250 to $500. Uh, so congratulations and thank you to those of you who, in the audience who may have taken the field test. And these were then uh, taken together, uh, looked at, and, and again, reviewed uh, prior to the launch of the actual exam. Uh, I mentioned in the preliminary uh, chat before we started uh, some of the anecdotes or testimonials of the students who had taken the exam. And by and large, the response was favorable. In fact, uh, you know, typically, you know, when you show testimonials, you don't show the negatives, right? But there really weren't any negatives. I mean, most students seem to like it. Now, whether it's because in comparison to part two, this new thing was better and, you know, the newness will, will wane with time. Who knows, there's a human psychology with that as well. But the idea here was if you prepared, if you took the exam seriously, you were paying attention over your, your time in dental school, the test was doable. And again, it's pass fail. It's not, it's not you know, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters personally to do well, but for licensing boards, they all wanna know if you passed or, or, or did not pass. And what were some of the comments that the students who took the pilot exams would? Uh, wanting to give back to the dental schools and to their faculty. Well, if you read these and go down, essentially it cycles back to that graphic I showed you about uh, changing or modernizing or updating the curriculum and the sequence of and, and where things are placed in, in, in the curriculum over the four years and all of that. FAQs coming towards the end. This is the last uh, part because I do want to have time for, for questions. Um, the exam, as you know, I assume by now, launches August 1st. That is the first day that the INBDE will be available. The part one was going to be discontinued the day before, uh, but due to the COVID-related uh, closure of the Prometric, Prometric Testing Centers, uh, we were asked by schools and students uh, to, to delay that. So we've delayed it by three months. It's going to end uh, in October. As of now, the part two will still be discontinued two years from, from this summer. And the website lists all the information listed in these bullets here, the background, the domains of dentistry, the test specifications, et cetera. My hope this evening is that having you had listened and perhaps suffered through my presentation, when you look at these, you can have a better uh, basket, if you will, a better context or framework to understand what really went into the exam and what the exam is really, really all about. At least that's my hope for this evening. Uh, in terms of the, the actual number of questions, it's very similar to the part two. 500 questions over a day and a half. In terms of the fees, the current year's fees are posted. For next year, the NVDE fee uh, will be $750. Uh, I use this opportunity to remind uh, many of you, uh, if needed, that we also are responsible for the hygiene exam. You know, the hygiene colleagues are, are an important component of the Joint Commission's mission. And unfortunately, we have nearly 5,000 hygiene graduates that can't get licensed because the, their testing center, which is the Pearson View, have closed. So we're looking day to day how at their reopening, how to get more sites, uh, ancillary sites to help this backlog for our hygiene uh, graduates as well. And coming back to the Dialoski, uh, this year it's about 800 plus dollars, sort of a uh, new, new exam discount for this year. Next year it will be 1650. And that still is, is in, in my understanding, less than the traditional, the REV, the CBCA, et cetera, exams and all of that. Again, it's pass fail. So if you pass, all you get is something that says, congratulations, you passed. If you were unfortunate and fail, you get a little bit more information about areas where you were more strong in and less strong in. The schools only get pass fail reports. 
and the state boards only get pass fail reports as well. And right now we are distinct, distinguishing a little bit, you know, part one, part two, but that distinction is, is minimal and it's going to go away uh, very, fairly soon. And right now, our understanding, because we've communicated to state boards quite a bit, there should not be any issue with uh, accepting the part one, part two, or INDD. Uh, our point is that we're then relaying to the state boards that the candidate has successfully met the criteria to pass or not, irrelevant of which exam uh, format it was. Quick facts. I'll hold off on answering the retest policy because this will probably come up on the Q&A. Uh, and yes, you might want to contact individual state boards about what they're doing with the INDDE. But as I just said, um, it doesn't appear that's going to be an issue. And additional resources, I think I'm repeating the, the website, at least one of the websites. And again, you'll have this all this information in the recording of this evening. The last slide I want to have, it, it just used to point out that again, the Joint Commission makes exams for licensure purposes, that exams that are valid, reliable, and fair. And that's it. How schools choose to use any of those exams is the school's choice. Whether it's a graduation requirement, a promotion requirement, that's not imposed upon by the Joint Commission. That's each school, their dean and their faculty determining how to use the, the, the exams and when to have students take or not take the exams. Uh, and, and the same is true for the state boards, whether they're going to accept or not any of these, how they accept them, that's up to them. Right now, all, all of the states in the United States accept the national board exams, the written exam. Uh, we're seeing now slow acceptance of the DL, of the Dialoski. Um, and I expect more of an exponential bump on that. And again, for those of you that join us in the future, when we talk about Dialoski, we can talk more about that. So with that, uh, I thank you for uh, your attention and I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much for that. That was really great. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming in already. And I think Jake and I tried to answer some of them. Um, but one of the major themes that we're seeing in a lot of the questions is, are there gonna be any study materials released ahead of time? And where can those study materials be accessed from? So let me back up a couple of slides. And you see here, preliminary sample questions. Those were some of the ones I showed you. And here you see, I don't know if, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but uh, the last bullet, INBDE practice test questions, those are online, okay, those are available. I believe there are some 40 plus questions. Now, as you can imagine, with all of these exams, there is a desire to, to keep the questions safe, if you will, right? That is one of the reasons why uh, you know, you sign away, you know, you swear, you pinky swear that you won't tell what the exam questions were, whether it's part one, part two, or now the integrated exam, right? And, and I can tell you that when the exams are evaluated before uh, the results are released, the, the experts in the, what's called the Department of Testing Services at the ADA, uh, they look to see if there's been a change in the response rate. So for example, if there's a question that was traditionally very difficult, let's say 20, 25% of the students got it right, but all of a sudden 80 to 85% of the students getting it right, then it's understood that that question has been compromised, that question is removed. So long story short, you're not gonna see volumes and volumes of test questions, right? What we're beginning to see is private firms Kaplan being one, I think others that are selling, uh, just like preparation for any other exam, uh, uh, question sets for this new exam. They're not being given by the Joint Commission. They're being developed based on what those companies are perceiving as questions most likely to be on the exam, given what is available currently uh, in terms of information that the board has released. So a long, long way of saying there are some practice questions, but it's not gonna be booklets and booklets. 
of information. Uh, Dr. Leone, can I add something on that? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I think all the students need to practice safe dentistry, okay? So I have been in practice for 25 years. When you graduate, you have certain amount of knowledge. So you're going to take this exam probably between third and fourth year. Start thinking all the clinical patients you have seen and then figure out what's the pharmacology behind the medicines they are taking. What the clinical situation, for example, you see a lichen planus, you see oral carcinoma. Start thinking in terms of how we can treat them. What's the reason the oral carcinoma is happening? Are they tobacco smokers? Are they cigarette smokers? Start thinking in terms of the overall patient management. You guys will be successful in this exam. You can see the sample questions. The whole purpose of this exam is like Dr. Leone presented, to have the clinical knowledge to have a safe practice of dentistry. Thank you. So start thinking in terms of each patient, how you can manage. That's the best way to learn as well. So to follow, to follow up on the question, so resources that students have used for part one and part two boards, do you think those are still useful in studying for the integrated boards, or is this a, should you not even bother with those, you know? Because some of those are very nitty gritty in the sciences for like the part one in particular. So I would say yes with a qualified yes. I think that by way of review, for example, let's take the part one, whether you're using the dental decks um, or the mastery app or what have you, um, yes, there's going to be a lot of nitty gritty questions. You can probably, I wouldn't say gloss over them. That, that would be incorrect of me to say. But you can probably understand that a lot of that won't be what you're going to be asked. But those details, if they're useful in having you remember the concept, then yes, then yes, that, that would be there. That's how I would frame that. I would say that the part two, question banks that you have access to, yes, they are probably useful without qualifying it so much. So I think the real trick here is to connect the part one content without, again, overloading yourself on a lot of minutia or what appears to be minutia that would then relate to the part two questions that the part two currently is not really asking in that way. That's really the way I would frame it. So yes, if you have the mastery app, which I think right now is the most favorite, at least by the students I've come across, the dental decks, you know, they're pretty, pretty thick in terms of the, you know, the back of the, the dental decks. But again, it's useful to review, but maybe not so much for deep memorization, but more of, a, of an understanding, kind of how you absorb it for what would be the questions on the national board. I hope that, that answers that question. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Leone. Thank you. Um, there's also been a few questions in the chat box about international dentists and how they should best prepare for this exam, given that they don't have the traditional school programs to prepare for part one and part two. That's a great question. And, and there's layers to that question. Um, one is, I would say that the same materials that are available to the domestic individuals uh, are ones are materials that would be helpful to the international students. So I would say avail yourself, however, of the, the prep materials, those questions. Um, certainly it's difficult to know how your particular curriculum and an international school does or does not compare to your average curriculum in a, in a US dental school. Uh, that I have no answer to. Uh, another layer that wasn't asked, but I will throw it out there, is that I've said several times that these exams are designed strictly for licensure. They never were designed for admissions, for admissions to, a, say, an advanced standing program for internationally trained dentists. Um, and that's not going to be the case by admissions departments going forward. One of the reasons that 
uh, the changes occurring is that a lot of schools were using part one, as we know, for um, uh, admissions and being able to exempt international students from say the basic sciences. Again, that was never the intent or design of those, of those exams. So it was actually a misuse of, of, the, of the exam. The Joint Commission for many years before my time was aware of that, sort of closed one eye, let it go. But in a few years time, it will be clearly stated by the Joint Commission that we can't use these exams as an admissions criterion. So a lot of layers, I answered a question you didn't ask, but in terms of the original question, avail yourself of, of, of all of the materials that anyone else in the US would have. So to touch on curriculum a little bit, so a lot of current students right now are sort of in the crossroads that the school's curriculum is based solely on the part one, part two boards. And there's a lot of new items on this integrated exams you guys talked a little bit about this evening. Um, how do you think students best prepare for those new topics that may never been a part of our curriculum? Are there uh, useful documents we could review? So uh, the short answer is, I don't know, right? Which is not a, not a really good answer uh, for sure. Um, with the new material, I go back to what I said about the graphic, you know, the circles. Although they, I, I kind of portrayed it, you know, that they're going to be new and, and all that. Initially, there won't be a preponderance of those, those kind of questions initially. And again, one of the bullet points I had was with, with the schools and the curriculum is going to be an ongoing kind of a tweaking. Keep in mind that, that commissioners, several commissioners are our faculty members, myself, for example. Um, Jacob, you're from Buffalo. Well, your dean is a, is a commissioner, right? So deans, associate deans, uh, we have a vested interest in making sure that our students are not uh, at, a, at a loss or in any way in jeopardy because the exam is asking for material or new material that the schools aren't teaching, right? So the short way of answering it is yes, over the next several years, there'll be increasing questions on that new, on those new areas. But right now, given the, the pilot results from those students that took the, the pilot exams, my sense is not to worry so much in these next few years about taking the exam. And the schools are certainly aware of this and we have anxiety. I, as an academic dean, have a lot of anxiety about what my curriculum is supposed to look like to better serve our students. Um, and it's an ongoing question among our faculty. It will be sorted out and we commit as a joint commission that we're not interested in, in hurting uh, people, you know, preventing them from practicing. So long way of saying, um, worry a little bit, but not so much. Uh, what information is out there to study that? Uh, that may be more in the things that, um, that may be coming later in your, in your um, curriculum, like literature review, the seminars, uh, the smaller groups that are not quite your traditional, you know, lecture-based, take an exam, Take another exam kinds of things. So again, it's not, it's not a satisfying question, but I hope it does answer as best I can this evening. Let, let me add for Dr. Leone's comment. That's very good, Dr. Leone. For example, e-cigarettes, all right? So you see a lot of kids in, uh, my, my son is a pediatrician, see a lot of kids coming into his uh, office thinking e-cigarettes are good, so you need to be aware of that, what's going to cause in you know, oral tissues, you know? So things like that, you need to be aware and you need to be reading uh, and then make sure you guys organize some lectures like Dr. Leone said to find out what's involved. Uh, so you will be uh, knowledgeable and then we'll be able to answer those questions as well. Thank, Thank you. you. And if I can, I know you have other questions. Let me just put a, a, an emphasis on that. You know, we are, all schools have to um, uh, show and demonstrate to CODA, the Commission on Dental Accreditation, that we meet the standards that they prescribe. One of those standards is that individual graduates 
must be competent in evaluating the scientific and lay literature. And so that is a way I think that that schools are looking at helping with, with this. Um, you know, you have, um, you know, lay literature, meaning, you know, what's on websites, what are the, some of the things that patients come in with GDOC, I read on the website, this, that, or the other thing. So again, for the schools that are doing that in whatever way, whether it's in lecture or seminar, rotations, externships, I think you're, you're going to be in okay shape for those questions. Thank you. Well, that's reassuring to hear that you guys are taking into consideration too. So great. Um, can we now talk a little bit about retaking the exam? So what happens if you're unfortunate and don't pass in your first shot? Right. The answer is that it's a moving target. And if you go back to one of the bullets, you'll see, actually, let me go back. So um, the Joint Commission periodically reviews the policy. And so in 2021, they're going to uh, review it. And maybe this looks a little confusing. There is the five year, five attempt rule. And when it was first introduced for the part one, part two sequence, five attempts, five years, and or you were done, you know? And so that's been changed. So after the fifth attempt or fifth year, you must wait a year uh, before you can reattempt. But you as a candidate can appeal. I as the chair and all chairs receive appeals from candidates asking to waive, having to wait one year. And if the reasons that are given seem valid enough, then those, those are granted. They're not all granted, but a fair number are. In addition, individually, as you're going through the five years and five attempts, like you see with the part one, part two, there's a 90 day waiting period. Here we go again, sorry, 90 day waiting period. Um, in here, after the third attempt, there's a requirement that you wait one year before retesting. That may not coincide exactly with what currently exists for the part one, part two. And again, that is, is uh, an area that you can appeal. And again, it will be looked at uh, again next year uh, once we get some more data on this exam. Keep in mind that um, we want to make sure in part that that individuals have enough time to be successful. No one wants to set an individual up for failure. And it's felt that 90 days is enough time given that life goes on, school goes on to review and re-prepare for the exam. Uh, but again, I, I will say for the third time that you can always appeal. You can always appeal. And if you have a valid reason, those appeals can, can on occasion be, be approved. Was there any additional question on the on the uh, attempts policy? No. Okay. And the current and the current policy uh, is online. And and I would say, apart from what I may say this evening, the best information is what's online because it will likely be changing over time. Great. Um, there was a question earlier, and I just wanted to clarify that I answered correctly that. Um, students now that had their part one examination rescheduled as a result of parametric center closings, um, are they able still to um, email the joint commission, have their exam canceled to receive a refund to reapply then to take integrated boards? So that those mechanics are not something that commissioners deal with specifically. Um, my sense to the answer to that is no, but rather than taking my word for it, I would contact the board directly. When in doubt, contact the board and you'll get an answer immediately. It's preferable to asking someone like me that may not quite know a specific answer or certainly classmates or, or, or anyone else. So ask the board, but my sense is that the answer is no. But again, this COVID thing has been, every day has been something different, right? Uh, what we thought three months ago, two months ago, last week is not what we think today. So I would say uh, two things. One, I'm sorry I can't answer it for sure, but secondly, more importantly, go to the board and find out. Yeah, and for people wondering about that, the Joint Commission has like a chat feature on their website as well as like an email you can contact and you can get a response in like a day or so. So very good about responding. 
Um, Dr. Leone, do you mind going back to your first slide, which compares INBDE versus the DLOSCI? Because we've had a lot of questions um, referring to which you can take, if you can take one instead of the other. Yeah, so, so that's a great question to ask. And it comes from, again, this confusion that I was hoping to, to clear up. Um, the two are separate. There's no one substitutes for the other, right? So currently, until August 1st, in order to be licensed in any state in the United States, you must do two things at least, well, three things. You gotta graduate from a dental school, right? You have to pass the national boards, the boards, right? And right now it's part one, part two. And thirdly, you have to pass a clinical exam that up until recently had nothing to do with a joint commission, right? And this was typically your patient-based, you know, let's say the, you know, the CDCA, the, the old uh, NURB, you know, there's the mannequin, you know, the endo, the restorative, the you know, cross, then there's the patient-based, and then there's the written that goes with that. That, those exams, those clinical licensing exams were not in the purview of the joint commission. So, excusing or taking away the Dialoski for the moment, in order to graduate from school, you may or may not need to take a board, right? The, na the national board, part one, part two, or INBDE. That's up to your school, right? I can tell you that in my school, Boston University, it's a graduation requirement to take the exam, but not to pass. And there's reasons why we do that. I know other schools make it a graduation requirement. Again, that's the schools. But you have to take the exam and pass completely in order to be deemed eligible for licensure by the licensing boards, right? The DL OSCE is the Joint Commission's attempt, if you will, or intent, maybe better word to use, as a possible substitute for the clinical boards, for the REB, for the CDCA, for credits and all of that. And if you choose to take the DL OSCE, you're taking it because you're hoping that the state you want to practice in, practice in will accept that instead of the REB credits, CDCA, Southern Regional, what have you, okay? It's, it's a licensing. The, the DL stands for Dental Licensing. Dental Licensing Objective Structured Clinical Exam. So the, the, the integrated exam and the Dialoski are not interchangeable. They're, they're, they're testing separate things. The Dialoski, more specifically, those practical things that you need to know to demonstrate the practice part of it, just like on the, on the board, but there's no, there's, no, there's no patient and there's no mannequin with that. The, the INBD covers some of that material, but much more. Okay, um, I don't know if that, that's a lot of words I recognize. I, and if that individual is still not clear, I'll, I'll try to do a better job answering that. Does that, or those individuals, does that, does that help explain it? Can you see in the chat? Let me, let me say this, some of the state boards are confused. They're not understanding the difference between the DL OSCE and the INBDE but they're separate exams. And let me go to the next slide. Maybe this will help again. IND is broader, all right? It's replacing part one, part two, period, period. You either take part one, part two until 2022, or you take INBDE. The, the same focus of that exam. The DL OSCE is a way if state boards want to, to have you not have to use a patient, a patient-based exam. And some states are looking at accepting the DL OSCE with the mannequin, right? But the Joint Commission, when the DL OSCE was created, decided that they were not going to have a mannequin component. And that we could talk more about that on the DL OSCE presentation. I hope, I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I know there's only two more minutes until eight. Um, so I think we can end with more of an open-ended question. 
um, because we have some pre-dentals and also D1s in the audience today. What would you recommend to a D1 student to get on top of studying? How would you prepare for it from the very beginning? Great question. I would say that um, certainly pay attention to your basic science, your biomedical courses, for sure. Um, ask your faculty to provide the education instruction in increasingly case-based format. In other words, framing, let's say, the gross anatomy in a, a scenario that you likely might see as a clinician. What's an example? Okay, so neuroanatomy, you learn about which nerves, cranial nerves innervate, you know, the eye, you know, pupils dilated, pupils constricted. So let's say you have a scenario where you have a person that was in an automobile accident. You are now a first year intern in oral surgery, patient comes in. How does that relate? How, how does that relate? Yes, you, you need to know uh, the pathway and all of that. But in terms of remembering several years later, can it be framed in terms of the uh, a clinical scenario? So I would ask, I would, you know, have your student government or whoever ask your faculty to be thinking more and more in those lines. So that's one thing. I would still use the things like the, the mastery app, the dental decks, uh, to, to, as you're going even through the courses, sometimes students find those helpful. I know that in microbiology, uh, oh, I can't remember the name, something that's available um, that helps with microbiology. Um, I know that a lot of students find the dental decks for dental anatomy to be very helpful in studying for dental anatomy. And I would imagine dental anatomy is still a, mostly a D1, a DMD1 yep. uh, course. Um, so yeah, so I would say do that, but I would say as well, get your faculty to maybe update their, their courses with, with, not entirely, but with more case-based scenarios that would be applicable. Also, let me add for Dr. Leone's comment uh, at case. This is talking about 1985 through 89, when I was in dental school. First years are supposed to work with the seniors and the juniors as an assistants, all right? So here you are, you're getting exposure to the clinical areas while you are a freshman. So there are time allocated. I think Dr. Leone's school might have a similar program in Boston. Things are going to change during on the curriculum and similar questions as commissioners, we ask of the educators in the commission. They are saying the same thing. So the, the whole curriculum is going to change. So being a D1, D2 students, you guys have to work with the faculty and get clinical exposure. So that way, when you see a relevant case, you will remember, okay, this is what I saw on Tuesday. This is what I saw last month. Thank you. Am I correct, Dr. Leone? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question. Um, so the INBD being a two-day exam, can you talk about how that's broken down? Like is one day longer than the other? Or is, there, is there more focus on certain questions the first day versus second day? So um, I believe the first day is, is the longer day, uh, just like part one, I mean, I'm sorry, the part two exam. Um, whether that changes over time, could be, I don't know, but right now it's, it's a long first day uh, and a shorter second day. Uh, in terms of how the content is broken up over those two days, as of now, my understanding that it's fairly equally distributed. There's no, um, there's no sense that in the morning of the first day, you'll have more, let's say, questions related to, to gross anatomy. In the afternoon, you'll have restorative sciences. The questions are gonna be interspersed. They're not gonna come uh, in batches necessarily. Uh, the only way you'll get batches is when you have, uh, say, a case uh, scenario, say, using the patient box that has more than one question that's being asked uh, in that case. But the, the content is distributed fairly randomly throughout, throughout the, the day and a half. And there are breaks, just like currently there are scheduled breaks, unscheduled breaks, and you want to be mindful 
uh, to make sure that when you, whatever break you take, if you think you can go back and check questions, you may not be allowed to. So you wanna, you know, do look at the board uh, website uh, in terms of how the, the day is conducted so that you know when the breaks are coming, uh, whether you can take an unscheduled break and all of that. Great, thank you. Well, we're a little bit after eight o'clock now, so do either of you have anything else you'd like to add before we call it for the evening? I would say thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, you learned that I don't give short answers, so uh, too bad. Uh, you decided to volunteer, uh, number one. But more, but you know, seriously, thank you. It's late in the day. We, we as commissioners will try very hard. We have been to communicate to all the stakeholders. Uh, you can email me, uh, hopefully I won't get a flood of emails, but I'm happy to answer questions. But again, the best source of information is the website, the chat room, go to the board itself. Uh, I, I will cycle off my four years uh, time on the board ends on the commission ends um, in, in October. So we come and go, but the staff are very dedicated and they remain and they're really helpful and desiring of answering your questions. Thank you again for having me with Dr. Leone. Um, I'll be around for one more year. So you guys can send me questions and if I can answer, I will be glad to. Otherwise I'll get the Department of Testing Service uh, help me out on the answers. But, from bottom of my heart, I wish you guys all the best. Study hard, do well, and then enjoy the success for your hard work. That's all I tell my kids. So you guys know different. I wish you all the best. Thanks again for having me. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. You. Leone and Michelle and Jacob. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Leone and Dr. Ragunathan. Uh, we really appreciate so much for you guys joining us tonight. And uh, I can vouch that we really learned a lot tonight, and everything was very helpful. So and thanks. Yeah, we are willing to. Yeah, we are willing to come again if you guys want us. So you know, I know Dr. Robinson and Dr. Leone, they were behind the Delosky exam, so they will be able to help you guys again with that. So uh, we're going to take you up on it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. And, and I would say thank you to Jacob and Michelle and ASDA. ASDA is a great organization for all that you do for yourselves, your colleagues. Thank you. Yes. Uh, when we were in dental school, I think we were busy with ASDA also. You could see we still keep it going. So um, don't worry. Uh, I think uh, that's good. You guys are very active and together we'll make a difference. Uh, you know, that's the bottom line. Thank you and then stay safe. Thank you. You as well. All right. And thanks to all our attendees tonight for joining. Uh, like we said, look out for a future webinar about the DLOSCI as well as other uh, webinars and presentations from ASDA District 2 and all the other ASDA districts and national ASDA. Uh, thank you all for joining and like Dr. Gunathan said, stay safe, stay well. Thank you guys. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>